Welcome back to Beer Brackets, everybody. Today, Alessandro, look at this beer. Look at this beer. We have been talking about reviewing this beer for years. This is one that we've wanted to get to. Obviously, an extremely recognizable brand in the beer world. Ho, or as it says on the website, as it's pronounced, Who Garden. Who, not Ho Garden, they say Who Garden. H W H O. Who Garden. Naturally cloudy, as it says here, wheat beer brewed with coriander and orange peel, which we'll talk a little bit more about in a moment. Man, I'm so excited for this one. This is awesome. Oh, me too, man. Like, I feel like it's it's crazy that, you, like you said, it's been years since we first mentioned this and we just now are getting to it. But it's just to show like how vast this beer world is. Like there's so many that you yeah. <laughs> you can pick. Like it's difficult. It's exactly. There's so many beers to get to in so little time. In the next couple of months, we're going to be tackling wheat beers like we never have before. Obviously, we've reviewed one or two in the channel before, but we figured, you know what? There's so many wheat beers that we want to review and get to. So many big, important wheat beer brands uh, that we just haven't had the chance to touch on. And what better time to do it than in the summertime, right, my friend? So we are starting off with probably the king of classic big brand wheat beers, the Who Garden. So my friend, this is actually brewed in the village of Who Garden in Belgium. And it's been known for its white white beers, as it says, or its wit beers, since the Middle Ages. Man, since 1445, to be exact, is how far back in beer history they can trace this beer which is unbelievable. And just like so many different beers in the past of the Beer Brackets universe, this is a monk beer at its roots. Wizard. The monks of Hoogarden began in 1445. They began to experiment in mixing Corazio orange peels and coriander in with their wheat, because apparently the original version of this wheat beer was very sour. So mixing in these different elements gave it a little bit of a, a sweeter, a more palatable flavor. And they started experimenting with the orange peel and they made what they call this divine beer discovery. And they call it divine on their website. <laughs> nah. it's, when you call I something have... a divine, <laughs> it, 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 you know it's going to be good. <laughs> and especially if it involves beer. Like, come on. <laughs> especially if it involves beer. Exactly. And this process continued successfully for hundreds of years, literally hundreds of years until now. And, you know, became one of the largest brewers in the 18th century. And, you know, at one point, actually, you know, Who Garden became this little hub of breweries and they all shut down. But then this one man, Pierre Sellis, he was a milkman, a milkman, <laughs> Alessandro, a Belgian. It's <laughs> very fitting. <laughs> very, he was a Belgian, a Belgian milkman who had grown up next to the brewery and had spent some time working in the brewery. He decided, I can't let this beer style die. He decided to revive the style. He started a new brewery and he started it in his hayloft. He had a hayloft on his farm where he lived. <laughs> That's wonderful. I'm in, I'm picture I'm trying to picture him climbing up there and, and starting. I had, and in the 1980s, you know, demand for this product continued to grow, and he eventually bought a former lemonade factory nearby to where his hayloft was, and he expanded his operations. And you know, Hogarden, Who Garden is still brewed there to this day. In that little town. That's, that's, that's wonderful. That's a wonderful story and history that is bringing us even more into this review and making us feel like more connected to the beer. Thank you, my friend. We're placed. We're placed in, in a moment in time, my friend, to properly taste and review this beer. Good old, good old Peter Sellis in his The Milkman. The Milkman. Delivering Hogarden <laughs> to us. Now... My friend, before before we, we, we go into the next stage, I wanted to ask you something because I actually always like to look a little bit around like on the bottle, the, the beer can. And I yeah. love that, as you can see here, I have the bottle. On the back, it, it, it has actually instructions on how Does it? to properly pour it, which I always thought like was, was it's cool when, you know, when a beer is telling you. But what it says is that there's a four-step process to pour the bottle. What? And it says first chill. I don't have this four-step process on my can. See? Oh, I'm so jealous. But but maybe it applies to the can too. So the, the first is to chill, obviously. Second yeah. is uh, pour As two thirds does. of the bottle. And then third, very important, is swirl the bottle. And then <laughs> top off and enjoy. Can you guess why they're okay. doing that, my friend? Okay. 
So maybe that doesn't apply to the can. Maybe like the sediment as it, you know, gathers at the bottom of a bottle. Maybe that's slightly different. E exactly. And so, exactly. And you know what? This is naturally cloudy because this beer, this style, Limp Beers, is actually unfiltered. Right, my friend? And that's what gives it its little cloudy appearance. No, exactly. And I, I was also curious, apparently, like at least the bottle version, it's mm -hmm. bottle fermented. So I was wondering, like, does it say anything about can conditioning or on, on yours? It says nothing about being can conditioned, unfortunately. I'd be curious so like, we... to, to dig a little. I didn't, I only found like on their website, it was only talking about like mm. the bottle version, uh, but I'd be curious. Well, you know, we've come across this recently in our beer discussions about how can conditioning was, you know, not relatively new, but a newer process than bottle conditioning, right? When we talk about the Sierra, Sierra Nevada Pale Ale was one that was only semi-recently can conditioned, yeah. correct? It looks like Ho Garden hasn't gone to that point yet. So keep that in mind throughout the review I'm using the un can conditioned version he's using the bottle conditioned version himself let's crack these open my friend let's, let's pour out this delicious delicious beer let's do it so we will have an inside the brackets on this coming up so do keep an eye open for that episode but what would you tell people about this wit beer style so the main thing to know is that wit like is uh white uh, so it's that's exactly. what describes like the the color and the cloudiness but also they are made with wheat and for wit Specifically, the style mm. uses orange peel and coriander as yes. it's not a requirement, but that's usually the case for my understanding. So uh, those are definitely yeah, the characteristics. Yeah, that's usually what differentiates that style. Exactly. The characteristics that yeah. makes them different than regular wheat beers or other wheat beers, let's say. And I believe it also has a higher percentage of wheat compared to a standard wheat beer. You are correct. Like it, it, on the, if you just say on wheat beer, yes. But I think, for example, with German Hefeweizen, yeah. like I think they also have that kind of requirement. So it's you oh, can, I think you, you can see it as a, as a subcategory of the the bigger wheat mm -hmm. beer family. But then, like once you get in, like there's every subgroup has depending, obviously, especially when it comes to regions, like it, it varies a little bit. But uh, that's a very good point. So I was telling Alessandra about this before we started filming, but this Hogarden glass here has been with me for quite some time in my life, and I actually did keep this from a pub that I was once at when I was a you know, younger Joe. Had a couple of Hogardens out on a patio one, and I loved the glass so much. I thought, you know what? I bought so many Hogardens here tonight, I pretty much bought this glass. <laughs> and I brought it home <laughs> with me. But you know, it's funny. Hogarden was always like, especially growing up in Montreal in the patios in the summer season, Hogarden was a really popular beer to have out on a summer night, and they would always serve it with a slice of orange. Yeah popped right in there, filled up, and you'd always get it in a classic Hogard, octagonal Hogarden glass like this. Oh, this is fascinating. Aroma cheers, aroma my friend. Aroma cheers, my friend. I was just about to say, like, it has such a such an amazing aroma. And it's interesting you mentioned that you used yeah. to drink it at a younger age. For me, it, like, it was, it took me a bit, like, to appreciate it. It was a wheat beer, like I've mentioned this before on the channel, is not the, one of the styles that have, uh, that I started, like, appreciating until after a bit of my beer exploration. But this one here yeah. is definitely one every time I go back to it, I love how well balanced all of the nuances are. Like, and it's so particular. I mean, absolutely. It's so, so particular when it comes to wheat beers. And you know what's funny? I, I didn't even know back in those days, I didn't know the difference between a wheat beer and a lager or a Pilsner and any other kind of beer. So for me, it was just like, I thought Hogarden was the only wheat beer that was out there. When I was trying this, I was just like, this is just what Ho Garden is. It's for, <laughs> and I had no idea it was made of wheat. I didn't even bother to think about it at that level. But yeah, I always appreciated it for its uniqueness at the time. All right. Let me know what you think, man. This is an aroma for the ages. So, yeah, no, it's, it's, it's amazing. Like, I kept going back in the glass. So, uh, you, you have this classic, like, a little bit of that classic wheat beer aromas, like, underlying mm -hmm. everything. So, that slight sourness, a little bit off that bubblegum kind of uh, yeah, banana uh, for sure if you if you want this estuary exactly estuary character but then the beauty of this is that you have the strong citrus component yeah. i i wouldn't i mean i know obviously there's orange peel so i'm i'm inclined to think that it's that but and there's this like spices that like comes at the end like it's so complex i really like I this aroma my friend i'm gonna start high here with the three what do you think whoa you know it's funny i had no idea how Hogarden would do in a beer brackets beer review because obviously People have their opinions about Ho Garden. I always thought it was such a delicious beer, and it's amazing that you gave it a three-on-three three to start with. And I'm going to agree. I'm going to give it a three-on-three three for the aroma as well. I think just the citrus, like you can really almost smell the orange peel. Yeah. And as well, like, you know, they say coriander. I don't necessarily pull coriander directly from. I'm sure it's part of the mix, but there's definitely some spices in there, some interesting spices like clove, 
maybe even like a little bit of cinnamon, like a nutmeg. If you if you want to look for those kinds of aromas, you can find them in there. It's, it's complex enough. It's a three on three for me, man. This is making me want to go in for a sip really badly. And I'm actually upset that I haven't had a Hogar in a long time. So uh, cheers, buddy. Let's take a sip. Cheers. Cheers, my friend. Mm. Mm. Yeah. Okay. Oh, that's nice. Beer memories. Wow, this is bringing back memories. Isn't it? Isn't it cool how beer, in particular, but oh flavors in general, can do that? Like you take a sip or a, a bite of something, and it just takes you right back to a place and a time. Like it's just so cool. Yeah, dude. I to be honest with you, I don't think I've had a Ho Garden maybe like twelve years. <laughs> it might have been that long. <laughs> And awesome. this is bringing back memories of sitting on those patios, summer nights in Montreal, with ordering pints of Hogarth. And yeah, sorry. What do you think of the taste? Well, my friend, uh, I mean, I love how, you know, a lot of times with uh, wheat beers, you get like almost like a punch in the face uh, with, the, with the flavors, banana and, and clove. And But in this case, I like it because it's almost the opposite. Like the flavors are, you don't taste it immediately. You just get this nice refreshment and then slowly... Yeah. They build up and they are not like all together at once, but they're just like appearing one at a time and you really have the yeah. time to appreciate each one of them. And they're very yeah. well done, like very balanced. I think my friend, like uh, I'm sticking with the three so far. I'm really enjoying it. It's very, very well done. You're staying high. Mm -hmm. That's great. You know, there's kind of like um, behind the citrus and behind sort of like the, the spices, there's kind of like a very strong maltiness. I remember reading somewhere about Hogarden where it's almost like they specifically wanted to hide the hops because there's no hop presence on this whatsoever. And so there's like this strong sort of like sweet bready maltiness. And that's always what I remember of Hogarden. Yeah, on the aroma, there's the citrus and the spice. But on the taste, that sort of maltiness, that breadiness, is kind of like the calling card for me. I always thought the taste of Hogarden was just like a little unbalanced but that gives it character because there's a little bit of like a harshness to it a bit a, a little bit of just uh, this electricity to the taste <laughs> that's a good, um, that's that a isn't good complete that's a very good you like that right <laughs> yeah just a little sparkly electricity that so it's not a hundred percent smooth uh, but that gives it character uh, so it's not necessarily a big detractor from it but i think i'm gonna go with a 2.5 because i think there's just a little bit of an imbalance between the citrus and the maltiness there where I find it does tire my palate after a little while. You know what we got to do now? Beer bracket tradition. We got to do a little refresher. A little refresher here. Let's see if I can fill it up. Does an entire can? Well, I've already drank a couple of sips, but the entire can should go up to the whole garden. There we go. Mm. So good. Mm. I love this octagonal glass. It's so, it's just this massive thing to hold in your hand. I think it's uh, it, that's part of the appeal. Like I haven't had uh, uh, who, who garden in a, in a glass uh, in the proper glass exactly. in a long time, but I do remember always like that feeling of like it's almost like you you're you're holding this giant goblet almost. So like it it's it's a beer goblet exactly. It, that's exactly what it, it is. It makes it feel very official, which I like. It does. It makes it feel so official. <laughs> it sounds. It feels weird to say who garden. It, it does, doesn't it? Like I've always called it who garden. Like when it's me too. Who garden? Who garden? The carbonation is quite lively. I kind of like how it, it really bursts uh, in and when you take a sip, it makes it very refreshing. Yeah. I do find that uh, there is a little bit of, you know, I wouldn't call it sweetness, but it's a tiny bit of, of presence there that lingers a little bit more on the palate. Like it does, it's not cleansed completely. So I think very well done, about a 2.5 for me, my friend. What do you think? Yeah, I think there's like an oiliness on the mouthfeel that coats your palate and sticks mm -hmm. around a little more. And it's funny, you know, I said I haven't had this beer in 12 years. It's bringing back memories of the mouthfeel. Because, you know, when you drink, let's say, two pints of this, it coats your palate. It does. It coats your mouth. So there's definitely like a thick, oily presence to it. Um, aside from that, you know, I would have either really liked for them to go all in on like a very creamy, silky mouthfeel yes. or go high carbonation like an Erdinger. I think they're somewhere in the middle which for wheat beer always felt a little off for me. And I think that was the biggest detractor for Hogarden. I'm going to go pretty, I'm going to go with the 1.5 actually on the mouthfeel. That middle ground yeah. where they're not a little carbonated, a little oily, a little <laughs> silky, but it's just like in the muddy middle. I think for the muddy middle, I'm going to give it a muddy middle score, 1.5 on three. That's, right, for that's the completely fair. Completely fair. 
now we get to the finish. The finish of Hogarth is interesting. What do you think? So finish, it's, uh, like you said, interesting because it, it starts off with this uh, coming from the mouthfeel that you get like a little mm. bit of that oily kind of sweet component. And yeah. normally this is where in a beer uh, you would get like the hop presence coming back. But it's weird because that's not happening at all. No. What you're yeah. getting is all those spices. The interesting thing is that to me, the finish is more like a holiday Christmassy kind of beer. If I don't <laughs> yeah, know if that makes is, sense. Right? It totally, it totally makes sense. Like spicy, sweet, yes. bready, cakey. Exactly. A cakey is yeah. describes it perfectly, my friend. And you get all of those like almost nutmeg, cinnamon, spices with that orange yeah. peel, caramelized orange peel, which don't get me wrong, it's it's great. But I think I, I'm, I'm able to pinpoint now one of the reasons why, like, it took me a little bit to get into uh, this uh, yeah. specific beer is because, like, m like most people, this is a beer that also in Italy was enjoyed during the summer. And I, I think the finish is where I, you know, struggle a little bit because while the mouthfeel, the yeah. taste and the aroma is, like, taking me in one direction, the finish is, is kind of, yeah. like, bringing me, for me at least, it, 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 it's a little bit out of place for what the flavors I'm yeah. used to. So I think I'm going to follow your yeah. lead there and go with a 1.5. Not not because it's bad. It's just like for me, yeah. it's, it it takes me a little bit in a in a different direction. Maybe the spices are a little bit too pronounced. What do you think? That makes perfect sense to me. And I think, you know, when, when I started really drinking this beer on a regular basis in the summertime, like I described before, I was a lot younger and I didn't have as much experience with beer tasting. And the finish was always really jarring to me. I think that that middle ground like or the end portion i should say like the the mouth feel and the finish of the beer was always where i struggled with this the aroma was always delicious the taste was always good but then like that lingering mouth feel yeah. into the finish was just where it started to get a little sketchy for me. i think there's like that caramelized orange peel that you were talking about that's really really strong it, it lingers like the finish of this beer lingers you still taste it like 10 seconds later i don't know about you I, yeah i do at least like it just which is nice but if you're trying to get through a whole pint of it it makes it a little difficult towards yeah. the end. If you're just taking a one-off sip or two, then it's like, oh, that's nice. And you taste the orange and it lingers there. I'm not even half, you know, a third of the way through what would be a pint. And I'm already like, okay, it's it's getting a little old. <laughs> it's like sticking around a little bit. <laughs> yeah, I think a 1.5 is fair. But now is an overall beer experience, my friend. Um, from beginning to end for Hogarden Wit beer. Uh, Who Garden, Who I should say. <laughs> Who so, um, the Milkman beer. You know, we always say this is where the intangible come into play. And I think for me, mm -hmm. this was a beer that, like I said, initially it took me some time to learn to appreciate because mostly because I was, uh, let's say the, the, the first few beers that I was exposed to were predominantly lagers. And yeah. uh, and this one here being more of a wheat beer with more estuary components was a little bit outside yeah. of my realm. Uh, so it took me a bit to un, un appreciate them. But I will say that I've rediscovered it. And I, even tonight, I'm rediscovering a lot of the aspects of this beer. Uh, and I do think it's a it's an amazing uh, an amazing beer experience. And I, I'm definitely like, uh, now that we've had it, I'm probably going to seek it more often. But I think for me, it lends at a two. Because it, it, it it's a good combination of like drinkability, interest. And there are some elements that, you know, maybe like I'm not always in the mood for. What do you think? It's an interesting beer experience. Now that we learned a little bit about the history and those medieval monks who had been fermenting the wheat the and then added these this coriander and orange peel and the spice in order to balance out the sourness. For the most part, the people who have sort of taken the reins of Hogarden have tried to stay loyal to the original recipe as much as they could. And I think there's elements of that in this beer. And I think some people might write that off as just being unbalanced because it's such a big brand. They just assume that, oh, maybe it's not the best quality beer. But I think it might, this is a beer bracket revelation, my friend. I think it might be in relation to the fact that it was originally a very sour mash, like a very sour brew. And then all these spices were added into it to balance that out. So for me, that sourness on like the finish and that sort of unbalance was always what turned me off of it. But knowing a little bit more about it, it makes it a little bit more interesting. But, you know, it's unique. It is what, you know, you have a Hogarden, you know it's Hogarden. That's right? true. And it is enjoyable. The, the aroma is fantastic. The taste is really nice. It's a delicious beer. I think I'm going to go with a two as well. So calculating our final scores, everybody, for myself, it came out to a 3.5 on 5, which in our rating system is a great beer. For Alessandro, he rated it a little bit higher. It comes out to a 4 on five which is an excellent 
beer in our beer rating system. So there you go. Maybe that has to do with the bottle conditioning of his version or maybe just has to do with personal taste. Who knows? But a little bit of a difference in our ratings there. This was fun because I can't think of the last time where we had such a a wide sort of range between scores. You know, we had 1.5s, we had threes, multiple threes in your yeah. cases. This beer was a little all over the place. I think it's, uh, you know, it's it, it's a very synonymous of, of, of this beer in particular because like you said, it depends of how and when and how you've enjoyed it. And, and also like there's a lot yeah. of intangibles, but also very particular. And I like the, the term to use, There's there's an electricity about it. Uh, probably though. you know you know drives people to uh to it and uh you know even if you might not like it completely there's some parts of it yeah. that are interesting thank you for joining us and having a beer along with us everybody hopefully you opened a whole garden yourself and enjoyed that along with this review if you'd like to sponsor a future beer brackets episode and if you'd like to buy us a beer click that little button down below the little heart button that heart shaped button that you see and you know what we'll do you sponsor a future beer brackets episode we will give you a special shout out and cheers in a future episode where we will officially anoint you as an honorary beer explorer on the channel and as always do not forget to close your beer brackets. never forget never forget never forget until next time cheers